Hey everyone, I've now published four videos about homelessness in Japan, from how the homeless are different from those in North America, to who they are, to how they're being housed, to what volunteer organizations are doing to help. But what I've yet to cover is what the Japanese government is doing and what the overall reason for homelessness in Japan is. Is it a solvable problem? Just, just before we get into it, there's a lot of footage of Professor Gill sitting in his office where he's literally lecturing us. He's trying to briefly summarize complex problems, but some things simply take time to explain. So I hope you don't mind grabbing a seat and listening. I think you'll learn a lot, just as I did. In theory, they shouldn't have a homeless problem because the Japanese constitution in Article 25 guarantees every citizen a basic uh, standard of civilized living. And so if you have no income and no way of supporting yourself, you should be eligible for livelihood protection uh, in Japanese seikatsu hogo, which is the sort of basic uh, welfare safety net in Japan. If you can get that, uh, it's worth roughly 130,000 yen a month, about 1,300 US dollars. Well, it's not enough for a luxurious lifestyle, but it's enough to get by and keep yourself housed. So when we're talking about homelessness in Japan, uh, part of the question is um, how come they haven't all been given livelihood protection? How come they're, they're on the streets in the first place? Good question. So I asked him to explain how one would get livelihood protection. Each town and each ward in a large city like Tokyo or Yokohama will have a welfare office and that's where you should go to apply for help and that system does have problems because some homeless people for various reasons do not go to the welfare office they might not know that the system is available uh, to help them. Uh, they might be intimidated by big bureaucratic buildings. Um, you know, everybody's wearing a suit and tie and, and you're dressed in filthy rags. It can be intimidating for some people. Some homeless people have a sense of pride. They don't want to um, be a burden on the public purse. And that also makes them tend not to go. The government used to exaggerate the last of those factors and, and say that homelessness was mainly uh, guys who didn't want to be helped. Um, I don't think that's true of more than a small minority. But anyway, there were these various reasons why people tended not to go to the welfare office. Now, in the last 10 to 15 years, the system has improved so that now in a big city you'll usually have homeless outreach teams who will actually go out and look for homeless people uh, and, and explain to them what is available in, in the way of help and encourage them to come in to the various kinds of shelter that they have. So uh, that's been one of the positive moves in recent years. There certainly are some homeless people who don't want to apply for help uh, for reasons of, of pride. And there may be some who are too lazy to apply for it. I don't think that's more than a small minority. But this has been changing over the last few years. Um, the number of homeless people in Japan peaked in the year 2003. And in that year, uh, it was 25,296. And this year's number is just over 6,000. So uh, the homeless population as officially counted has fallen by nearly 80%. So I think it's fair to say that a lot of people who were homeless um, not because of pride or personal reasons have in fact been housed. And let me also give you a local example. Here in Yokohama we have one municipal homeless shelter. It's called Hamakaze, which means 
beach wind or beach breeze. It's got that nice Yokohama port sort of feel to it. And they have about 250 beds. And at the moment, only about half of those beds are used. They haven't been full for a very long time. And so if I was homeless in Yokohama and I was desperate for help, I could get a bed in that homeless shelter. The capacity is there. It's not that the shelters are crammed and, uh, and there's no, no room to get in. The current 2017 government figure of 5,534 homeless people means that four out of every 100,000 people in Japan are sleeping without shelter. In comparison, Canada's rate is eight, and in the United States, it's 55 per 100,000. But as the professor mentioned, the Japanese figures come from the government. Do academic researchers agree with those numbers? To find out, I met with ARCH, a Japanese advocacy and research center for homelessness. えっと、ホームレス問題を解決するために、えっと、まず一つは、えっと、現状をしっかりと調べて実態把握をして、えっと、有効な政策提言をしていくっていうこと。もう一つは、えっと、この東京の、あの、いろんな市民の人とですね、
are there to support guys who for one reason or another have not been able to get livelihood protection. So why are there still 5,800 homeless people in, I mean, I know it's a relatively small number considered the population of right. Japan, but I mean, right. why are there still homeless people then? Right, well, it, it is still, um, well, it is a very small number uh, considering the population is 127 million. And uh, there are a number of reasons why people remain homeless. First of all, some of them do not want to go into a homeless shelter, uh, perhaps because they're heavy drinkers and drinking is not allowed in the homeless shelter. Um, uh, or they don't like living a regimented lifestyle. If you go into the homeless shelter, uh, they switch the lights on um, early in the morning, they switch them off fairly early at night. Uh, you're not supposed to make a noise when people are trying to sleep. Um, and it, it, it's a controlled lifestyle. Meal times are at set times. Uh, it, some people don't like that lifestyle. Uh, they prefer to uh, move as they please and um, uh, uh, drink, smoke as they please and um, uh, so uh, they avoid shelters. Other people have been in shelters but they've been thrown out for bad behaviour um, or in some cases because they've reached the limit of the length of stay that's allowed in the shelter. And on this point, again, things have changed over the years. For example, in Tokyo, uh, they have these shelters called homeless independent support centers. And you're, the maximum length of stay is four months there. And you're not supposed to go back afterwards. At least that was the rule when they were first set up um, back in uh, around 2000 or thereabouts, uh, but they've gradually relaxed the rules and, and so that e e nowadays multiple stays are generally permitted, but sometimes you have to spend some t period of time out of the shelter before you can get back into the shelter. Another factor that we haven't talked about yet is the system of livelihood protection. Anyone who is unable to provide for themselves, has no income, uh, no way of looking after themselves, should be able to get this basic welfare provision. But it's not unknown for people to get refused livelihood protection, especially if they're male, not that old, and seem to be um, in reasonably good health and capable of working. Uh, such people are sometimes turned away uh, from the from Seikatsu Hogot, from Livelihood Protection. And some of the homeless guys that I've met were men in their 50s who were waiting until they reached the age of 60 because, as a rule, they don't refuse you for Livelihood Protection if you're over the age of 60. There's nothing about that in Japanese law. It's all to do with how the law is implemented by officials uh, in the local welfare offices. So that's another reason why some guys remain homeless. Uh, they're, they're kind of playing a waiting game until they can get livelihood protection. If you're looking at the homeless statistics, then you should also look at the livelihood protection statistics, and they are quite striking. Um, in 1995, that was the uh, low, low point for people on livelihood protection. There were 880,000 individuals uh, getting it then. Uh, nowadays, there are roughly uh, 2,200,000. So that's gone up by about two and a half fold. And of course, those numbers are much, much bigger than the homeless numbers. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons why homelessness has declined is because uh, the old prejudice uh, against men applying for livelihood protection, uh, people being turned away for reasons that were not actually written in, in the law, but to do with um, the 
kind of assumptions of the office officials running the system, uh, that prejudice has has greatly weakened and now you're much more likely to get your livelihood protection application approved. So this was a big problem, uh, now it's not such a big problem uh, and that's, um, that's part of the reason why we see the homeless numbers steadily going down while the welfare numbers are rapidly increasing. The, the idea that homeless people are homeless because they don't want help or they don't apply for help has gradually become uh, less untrue over these last 13 years because most of the people uh, who want to be helped um, nowadays generally are helped. Well when economists talk about uh, employment I think they usually consider a 1% level of unemployment to constitute full employment because there'll always be people who, are, who really are between jobs. Uh, and um, in the same way, I think there'll always be a few homeless people around. But um, I think the problem can largely be solved. And I think uh, Japan does offer quite an interesting model um, for other countries to consider in tackling homelessness. Um, the numbers don't entirely lie. It, uh, the homeless population surely is getting smaller in Japan. They have these many advantages that I mentioned to you, the lack of drugs, traumatized soldiers, uh, mentally ill people uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, in Japan it's, it's a, a problem that's particularly um, uh, capable of being solved and although there are a lot of problems these um, these poverty businesses are certainly um, among them and just because people aren't on the streets that doesn't mean there's no problem nonetheless in, in the limited definition of homelessness as being on the streets um, uh, I, I think it is a soluble problem and Japan has been moving in the right direction for the last 15 years or so. Even at its peak, there were only 25,000 people street homeless in Japan, which is a relatively low number for a big country with, with Japan's population. And so I think there are a lot of people who might otherwise be homeless who are staying with their parents, siblings, children, uh, grown-up children. Um, nobody keeps statistics on people like that, so it's not, it's not something you can count the way you can with people who are on these streets, but I'm sure that it is a, a very big factor. Uh, on the other hand, once you do become homeless, um, it's very difficult to relate to your family. Well, I've studied homeless guys in, in America and Britain as well as in Japan. And the, the guys I knew in America and Britain very often were in touch with their families. Like they would ring their mum once a month or something like that. Most Japanese homeless men don't do that. They're more cut off from their families than than homeless guys I know in other countries. Um, you've heard Japan described as a shame culture. That's one of the famous stereotypes about Japan. Um, there is a, a degree of truth in it. Um, if you've made a mess of your life, uh, you fail to get a steady job, you've become an alcoholic, um, uh, uh, you've been sleeping in parks and so on, then uh, you don't really want your family to know about it. And many of the homeless guys that I've met, they haven't seen their, their natal family, uh, or if they've formally been married, they haven't um, seen their wife and kids for 20 years, 30 years. Uh, they uh, try to just disappear off the radar as best they can. And uh, so um, the condition of isolation 
seems to be that much more acute for them than it is for homeless people in some other countries. Uh, and uh, so that is another factor that keeps some people on the streets. How come you, you know, even five or six thousand, I mean, it uh, still needs some kind of explanation. Um, and one factor is guys who, perhaps because they've been homeless for a very long time, uh, or they've been in and out of doya, these cheap flop houses, for a long time. Uh, they just don't relate to the mainstream housed lifestyle. And quite often I hear stories like this. Um, we got this guy off the street, we, we found him, uh, 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 we got him onto livelihood protection, we, gave, we found an apartment for him, and two weeks later, he disappeared. You hear that kind of thing quite often. Um, they're not used to living in that apartment. The apartment may be located in a different part of the city where they don't have any friends or know anybody. They may have habits such as tending to get drunk and make a noise, which uh, causes complaints from their neighbors, which makes it um, difficult for them to be there. They are not used to dividing the trash into five or six different types that get collected on different days and get put in different bags. They, they break rules like that. Uh, and uh, so friction develops with the, the people around them and eventually uh, they, they up sticks uh, and, and they disappear. And, the, and they wind up back on the streets and the cycle begins again. <clears throat> and um, so the welfare authorities are aware that, uh, of that kind of problem. And so another interesting development that we've seen in the last decade or so is experiments with group homes uh, where you might be living in an apartment with maybe half a dozen other formerly homeless men and perhaps one kind of NPO person or uh, who's supposed to be roughly in, in charge of it. But it's a sort of, it's you're housed, but that kind of friendly communal lifestyle with your, with your mates is still preserved. That's one of the new models of um, homeless care that we're beginning to see now. If you remember, and I know a lot of you do, I started off this whole deep dive into homelessness with a simple image, one of a blue tarp shack with solar panels on it. This was incongruous to my mind, because how could you be so organized as to have a well-maintained shack with energy, but not capable enough to get yourself into a basic apartment? Before I did any of these interviews, I started off by asking some friends and family about homeless in Japan. Beyond a response of I don't know, a couple things I heard that surprised me were that they were lazy or too prideful. And honestly, if you had asked me about homelessness in Vancouver, I'd probably have simple answers too. But I asked Yui, who works at San Yukai, if he could help me better understand the homeless in Japan and dispel some stereotypes. ま、家庭環境があまり恵まれてないような家庭環境で育たなくてはいけなくて、え、実の親に育てられなかったとか、それで教育を十分に受けられなかったりとかは中にはその友達の借金を肩代わりしたことで、でもその友達はどっかにい
生まれるっていうことはなかなか難しいと思うのでそういうことを考えると一概に個々人の責任っていうことだけじゃなくて社会の構造的な問題っていうふうに捉えていかないといけないのかなっていうふうに思っていますね。理屈の問題だけじゃなくて感情の問題みたいなのもあると思うんですよね。多分その路上生活してる人の存在を肯定的に受け止めてしまったら自分が今まですごい努力して頑張って生きてきて今の生活がようやくあるっていうことを否定されたような気持ちになっちゃう人も中にはいるんだなっていうふうに僕は感じてるんですけども、えー、そういう路上生活されてる人たちがいるっていう現実はあるわけでいやそういった現実を少しでも世の中としていい方向に変えていこうと。いうことを考えたときに、路上生活をしなければいけなくなってしまったような人たちも、この世の中で前向きにあの安心して暮らしていくことができるためにはどうしたらいいのかっていうふうに考えていかないと、いつまでたっても多分この問題っていうのはなくなっていかないなっていうふうに思ってます。Thank you very much to all those that gave me their time, from the researchers to the volunteers. And especially those that have lived through homelessness and shared their experiences. As always, thanks for watching. Bye for now.